All right, let's start. Our course for today is um, JavaScript is the duct tape of the internet. Um, I don't know how to explain that actually. Okay, for today our agenda would be, we're gonna talk about modules, um, asynchronous functions, promises, generators, and talk about event loop, okay? Um, we can start with modules. Modules are basically uh, fundamental building blocks of a code structure. The module systems allows you to organize your code and hide information and only expose the public interface when you use the module.exports. So again, um, this is encapsulation, okay? And every time you use the require keyword call, uh, you are loading another module. So basically when you use another module, you're doing dependencies already. You're being dependent on another file, okay? Or another object from another file, another function from another file, okay? Let's have a, whoa. <laughs> let's have a very easy, easy, easy example. So let's say, let's create a, um, a function, let's see, I think let's do first, not a function. I think we can do message or objects. Okay, let's do um, objects first before functions. So let's create a separate JavaScript file. And in that JavaScript file, data.js, um, we can create an object. We can do module.exports and then start creating our object. Let's say we have first name and let's say we have uh, James Bond, last name Bond. Okay. Now, if I go to my demo.js, let's see if we can use that, to that person, and then require, the require keyword. This is a common JS um, library that allows you to uh, easily call other modules and just pass in the parameter, your path. Uh, this one denotes your uh, root of your project, and then let's do data.js. Next, let's try if we can grab the data from the other file, person that first name plus person that last name. Let's put some quotations there. Okay. Nope. Error. Is it because modules export, blah, blah, blah. Let's see. So the keyword. Reference error require is not defined. Require is not defined. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, fix. So uh, I just need to change the syntax because of the ES6. So let's see if this works now. Still doesn't like to work. Uh, okay, so that was dangerous. Staying away from my code. <laughs> let's go back to my code instead and let's see if this works. Uh, let's, see. let's do another one. Yes. Function add, let's say function add B. Let's try this again, A plus B. And if this does not work, uh, let me, I might skip this first and go back to it later. Let's see. Ooh, that was dangerous. Let's try to use the require again. Let's see, add. Looks like it's gonna complain again. 
Why is it complaining? Let's try this again. Ooh. It's not going to work though. Yep, I think I need to go back to this again because I tried this a while ago and it works and it does not work. Uh, awesome. Okay, so um, I think this is just a syntax problem. But basically, if it works, what we've done here is you create a function and in the add.js file, and then you just use the module.export. And what do you export? The function add. Okay. And then next, you, in any files that you want, you now declare you want to grab that file and get that and just invoke the function. Okay. Same, same goes with objects and other values. Okay, let's try to skip this and do this after the break. Okay. Um, next, we'll try to do um, promises. So promises is basically like um, asking your mom, like, hey mom, um, if I get a good grade, can I have a, a lollipop or a PS4? So that's a very wide gap, right? <laughs> so, Promises are basically just like that. Um, promises is an object that may produce a single value sometime in the future. It can happen and it can also not happen, like uh, like a lot of broken promises, right? Okay. okay. Let's see. Um, to create a promise object, um, let's first create a variable and create a new promise object. And then inside the promise, it will ask two things, two parameters. One is the result, meaning the promise. One is the reject, promise unfulfilled, okay? Inside that um, promise object, also defined, um, let's say, let A, one plus one. And then next would, uh, let's have uh, oh, our function, okay. Nice. And then let's create um, a conditional evaluation. If A equals two, um, resolve, spits out a success, okay. Else, it will spit out uh, reject and fail. So we have now our um, variable P with the new promise object. Now, how do we use that? So the way we also use this is um, we can now use P as the variable. Dot notation access the API and one of promises, the promise API is you can use then. So then, okay, inside that is you can pass, let's say a message and we create another anonymous function and inside that let's say console.log and let's say this is a, a, a promise and then let's put the variable no, just outside instead. and then let's see the other one will create um, the catch close this and then we can do a catch as well so this is like the try catch and also promise has this api catch and we can put the message as well create another anonymous function and inside that anonymous function we have console.log and this is a catch plus message. Okay. And we get a, this is a promise success. How? So when we call P, what happened is it goes over this body. And again, we already defined a uh, variable A to have the number two, right? So it will go to this if statement and now it will invoke 
we solve success. And also because we have the then, not only you get, get the success, you also uh, get this one. Console.log, this is a promise, success. If let's say this evaluates to false or else, you'll get the other one. Questions? So another way that you can do promises from scratch is using a callback. Let's give a, an example with just the callback. Uh, let's say cons, user left, false, let's say false, and cons, user mm, watching at me equals false. And let's create our function, function watch, let's say tutorial, callback. And inside the function, we'll simulate the resolve and reject. And we'll just call them callback and error callback. Make this bigger. Now let's create our function body. Inside the function body, we'll try to do the same. If user left is true, uh, let's do an error callback. And inside the error callback, the function would um, spit out an object. It's denoted by this braces. Okay. And then we can have a key value pairing of name and just says user left and uh, message sad face. Oh, sad face. Okay. Else if, if user watching cat meme, let's um, call another uh, error callback and spit out an object, evaluate pairing, user is watching a cat meme. And message would be uh, tutorial, Sucks, or tutorial is greater than uh, no. Cat meme is greater than the tutorial. Okay. Uh, syntax error. Uh, callback syntax error. Uh, let's see. Wait. Put this down here. Need another bracket, I think. Okay, um, later. And then else, let's create another uh, conditional statement, callback. And then inside that is thumbs up and subscribe. Let's see, syntax again. Declaration or statement expected. Nest, nest, nest. This one, this one. Is this extra? Okay. Okay. Next, we'll try to use the function. Before we try to do a, a walkthrough, let's call the function. And inside that, Function callback, um, let's pass a message. And let's create an anonymous function. Console.log, let's say success plus message. And then let's use the error. If we get an error, or no, we pass the parameter and we just call it an error. Console.log. Oh, no. You can just use the error that name plus spaces error dot message. Okay. So what happens here is line one and two we create two variables. Um, user had uh, user left meaning if the user is still watching the video or not. We put a boolean value true or false. Uh, is user watching academy and that's a boolean value, true or false. Now, the way 
it would happen is when the parameter goes in, uh, it would go to these callback and error callback parameters, right? If you, it, it goes inside and let's see, user is still watching the video, it will, uh, no, if user has left, meaning he's not watching the video, we will throw this error callback, okay? If the user is watching a cat meme, we will throw this error callback, else we'll use this one. So inside this function, again, we pass, because this is, um, again, when we do a callback, our two parameters are actually functions. And as you can see, this first parameter is this one. So you pass the first parameter in your function as a function. And in your second parameter, you pass a function, which is this one. Okay. See if I like this. So right now with the current state that we have, um, user is false. Mm, I think something's wrong. User left, user false. Yeah, so user is user left false, meaning he's still watching the video. So it, it does not evaluate to this one. It checks for this one. Is user watching a cat meme? No. So it evaluates to this one instead. And now it uses the callback and also has a value, thumbs up and subscribe. When we now check the function, this will be success plus the message. This is the message. Okay. And then if we change the state of user left, let's say the user left and is not watching the video, it will evaluate to this code block, five to nine, and we should have user left. And no, did not like that. Callback is not a function. Okay, I think I have a typo. Callback, let's see. Wow, typos. Grab that instead. Uh, this. Here, okay, let's do that again. Let's try to make it through and user left. So because we have the user left uh, evaluated as true, when it goes to the function, this is what's going to be called. And this error callback, it goes here. It says console.log error.name. This error is just a parameter. And that error is the object. So it's like, this is it, this one. This is the error as the object. And you put the dot notation. And when you put the dot notation, you access the name. And again, with this one, we just concatenate. We invoke the error parameter, which is this one, this object. And then dot notation, we invoke message. Okay. And then if this is false, I think this is will be evaluated with this one. Okay. So this is a callback function. Uh, now we can refactor this to make it to a promise function, a promise object. And the way we do is first, we can, um, I think, remove this one first. Uh, put this a return. And in that return, we can do a new promise and resolve, reject. And then we can also delete this one to just call that. 
Okay. My tutorial still comes. And then now we can create this one and we can just put everything inside of the promise. And then we just change the parameter name. Let's see, let's see check. So, and let's see, what else is my typo? I think we reject. Oh, I need to close this one. Let's see. Okay, looks like I just need to grab the other code again and just show it side by side. It's way easier. Let's grab the other code. Let's put it down here. Comment down. So as you can see, we have the function. Now it doesn't have a parameter. Um, but inside that function, we would return a new promise object and it needs the resolve and reject. And as you can see, you also have the same one, the evaluation for the conditionals. And also at the bottom, you have the same one. Instead, you just invoke the then and then the catch. You don't need to now put two functions inside of it. You just need to invoke the one function and that function would invoke the promise. And now with the promise, you can use the dot then API and dot catch API. So this should work the same. Okay. Another one that you can use is, let's say we have a record video one new promise object and we have the resolve and reject and let's put this one here and let's just do resolve video one recorded let's copy that and this video two video two video Three, video three, and semicolon, semicolon, semicolon space, space. Okay. Um, another thing that we can do is we have three promise objects, right? We can also use the API of promise. It's dot all. So when you do a promise dot all, you can put an array of promises. Okay. And basically we can just use the variable because uh, the value of that record one is the promise object. So we can put that one, this one, this one. Let's try that one. Okay. <clears throat> so what happens here is uh, it will invoke record video one, video two, video three. Once they're they're all done, once they're all done then we can now use the dot then and have the message pass in there and log it out. So if video two is not yet finished, it will not invoke the dot then because you said promise all. So if you promised your mom uh, 96 in math, uh, 96 in history and 96 in English, but you got just 80 in English, she's not gonna give you your PS4. 
okay? Another way to use the API is the promise.race. This one, because the code block is so small, but essentially what would happen is if one of the promises gets done, let's say, hey mom, um, if I get 90 in history or um, math or English, and whichever comes first, if the teacher reported the grade, I can get the PS4 right away. That's the race, promise that race. Okay. Next, any questions for the promise? Um, I'll explain more later why promises are better than doing it the long way, the callback uh, from scratch. Uh, now let's proceed to uh, generators. So generators basically, uh, it's a function and you put an asterisk and in that function, you also have the yield keyword. What the yield keyword does, is it says, hey, use this value, hey, use this value. And the function doesn't need to really stop and you can keep yielding the value and have other uh, variables or functions use it. Okay, let's first give an example of not using a generator. Function normal func. And inside that, let's say console.log. And we can just invoke that. I am your father. Okay. Now we can convert this to a generator. Say we have a function. It's just not um, the function name would be, let's say, generator function. It has no parameters. Inside of it, let's do a console.log. This will be executed first. And then next is, let's say we want to yield hello. And then next we want to console.log again. Let's say I will be printed after the pause. Again, the yield pauses the program, okay, or function. Yield world. Okay, so let's do cons generator object, create a variable name generator object, and basically just pass the generator function. This tells us that uh, whenever you create a generator function, it, it kind of becomes an object. And again, with objects, we can have um, iterators, so we can iterate over them, okay? Next, we have console.log, let's say generator object. And now because it's an object, we have access to next. And also uh, this next API, uh, the, the, it spits out an object of value and done. The value is what the value, and done is just, is, is it still, do we still have more? If yes, it done is false. If no more, it's true. Okay, and then because we don't really want the key, so we want the value. Okay, this will be executed first. Let's try another one. Hello. So what happened here is in line number 10, the next one, Let's remove that again. The next dot value proceeded to execute line number two and stop at line number three. Okay, when you invoke the next again, the same command, now it will resume from the yield and print the other one and stop at the yield again. Okay, questions? Uh, another example, um, without generators first, let's say you have lifts, let's say you're working out, 
and in your lifts, you have squat, you do bench and deadlift, and also press, bench press, or whatever. Let's say number of times you work in a week is three, and how many days per week? Day six. Now let's create a total number of sessions that you do. We can just multiply number of weeks times days, actually days per week. Okay, still pretty simple, right? And let's create a counter for the index. So current left index, and let's just initialize at zero. Now we wanna uh, cycle over or iterate over the lifts, right? And let's say you keep working out um, squat, bench, deadlift, press, and you keep doing that until you stop. And basically, when you say keep doing that until you stop, you won't stop at the press all the time, unless it's like a 12 day or 16 days. But how about if you stop at 15 days, right? You should only get until deadlift. Okay, so let's do a const cycle. And in this const cycle, we'll use the spread operator to copy an array. And inside of that array, we want the length to be the total number of sessions. And now we're gonna use, because it's an array, we're gonna use a map operator to make some changes. And inside of the map operator, we already know that we need a function inside of it. And let's just put an object and lift as the key. And then the value is lifts. And then current lift index, increment that, modulus lift dot length. Okay, let's try to log that out and explain afterwards. It's undefined because uh, this got land. I think this one is wrong. Lifts, lifts. Nope, so wrong. This one. Lift, lifts, lifts. There you go. So we have squat, bench, deadlift, press. Squat, bench, deadlift, press. And until bench. So again, three times six is 18. So the person worked out for 18 times. Length of 18, index of zero. So to explain what happened here in this part, right? This one is easy because it's just say, um, keep putting an object to my, okay, going back. So first you created an array and the total size of your array is 18, okay? Now it's still empty. So we wanna put some values, but we just want 18 values, okay? Or 18 elements. So what do we put? We put an object denoted by the braces. And in this object, I want a key lift. This one is very easy, the, the lift is here. And the value is, we call the lifts array. We access the array with the bracket notation. Inside of the bracket notation, let's say for the first one, the current lift index plus plus is just zero. And we, when we do a modulus of the lift dot length, which is um, four. This is the length of the lifts. Only four, right? So zero modulus four, you get the value of zero. That's why you get squat. Okay. The next is, the next time it goes in uh, for the next one, uh, this one becomes one. It incre increments. 
one modulus four, you get the remainder of one. So that's why you get bench. And you get number two, remainder of four, uh, you get two. You get the what current result? Yeah, the answer. So um, let me just continue and we go to the end and you'll see what the modulus uh, magic powers has. So we started with zero, one, two, and let's say the current lift index now is three, modulus four which is the remainder of three. And in the array, this zero, one, two, three. Now we're at the end. Now the magic comes in. Let's say current lift index becomes number four, modulus four, it is zero. It goes here again. And then five modulus four, remainder one, it goes here again. Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. And there you have go. You have the bench as the last one. Questions? Would you like me to repeat or? Okay. Um, let's see. Actually, this is not yet a generator. But we'll, we'll create a generator that should have the same output. Okay. Function, let's denote that by the asterisk. And let's say we call it repeated array. And in that array, you have the index, instead of the current index. We don't need this anymore. And then now we do while, true, infinite loop. Okay. Yield, pause and resume. Also, um, it's saying use this value. Let's do the same one, index plus plus modulus the r dot length. Okay, this one, we still need this one. Yes, yes, uh, this one. Now let's do a next lift. Generator and repeated array lifts. Okay, what we did, like the previous example, is um, we created a generator function, and because it's an object, we we assign it to the uh, a variable so that it's easier to access. So we just called it next lift generator. Okay, so we don't need this anymore. And this time around, we're still gonna use the spread operator. This is still necessary to get the length 18 of the array. And then we just need to change this to next lift generator, which is this one, which is this one. Next lift generator dot next dot value. And crossing my fingers should work. It does not work. The syntax error. Uh, there you go. Should still have the same one. And just show, I can show you guys if I remove this value, I would get the next, which is right there. The value and the done. Oops. Value and done. Value and done. Okay. So one of the use case for this is if you want a infinite loop, but you still want to use it. Let's say you're doing a uh, fitness tracking app. There you go. That's a use case. You keep doing it. There's no like end, end goal, right? Okay. Um, let's move on to asynchronous functions and event loop. Okay, this time around, I'm gonna use a interactive online, uh, I don't know, is ID. 
because this one is a very cool ID. Let's try. So first things first, uh, when we have uh, JavaScript code, no, I should not mention the benefit. Asynchronous only just means that um, you can run things parallelly. You don't need to wait for other stuff to happen. You can just run it. Okay, let's say you have console log, console log, console log, that's synchronous. It should execute one, two, three first. Okay. First things first, let's um, simulate a uh, three functions. Let's say you have the multiply function, a and b as the parameter and inside of the function let's return a times b can we zoom in okay let's create another simple function it's called square and in that square function we just return the multiplication of the same number and lastly we want to print out Function print square. Let squared variable oops equals square n. Then we want to log that out. And let's in, just invoke the print squared function. T4. So before running this, uh, code block one to three for a function, five to seven a function, nine to 12 a function, 14 we invoke a function. So first thing is this gets invoked. It calls this function. Inside this function, it also calls another function, this one goes to here, square, goes to this function, and it's this function, it returns another function to multiply. And this should resolve after afterwards, this will resolve, it will return the value. And then now it can return the value. And now this completes. And now you can console.log the squared. So I'll run it and focus on the Call stack. Again, stack is just a data structure. when you push and pop. Okay, like a stack of pancakes. So I'll try to keep hitting the pause button because it might be so fast. Oops. Okay. Again, first it gets in. It, it, uh, the function that gets called is printed squared. It goes to the call stack, and then assume. I hit the show view. Uh, run the shoe. Wait. Mm hmm. No, because this is a from an author, but it's really, really good. Uh, square, 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 square. Damn it. Let's try to grab that code. Uh, I think I have a typo again. Squared, 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 squared. Check. There you go. Okay, I have a typo. So, first thing that got called is print squared. And then the next one that got, got called is, oh, I can't click. Sorry. Pause. Okay, we run. Pause. Okay. Print squared got called, we assume, inside the function body, the square function was called, assume again, and then inside the square function body, multiply was called, and then uh, inside the multiply function body, uh, it can do the multiplication now. So when you hit return, it pops the function out of the call stack. So this goes away, and then now, uh, multiply n times n, which is, um, I think, 4 times 4. And then it has a value now. It can return. And now this one has a value as well.
And then now the next line can now execute. So this is synchronous, step by step. Okay. We can also give a very simple example for recursion on the call stack on what happens if you have a uh, no base case, meaning it's like an infinite while loop. So with recursion, you get a stack overflow. So this is a visualization of what a stack overflow is. It does not get to result. Okay. Oops. Next, we'll try to uh, do an example of an asynchronous function. Console.log. Don't worry, it's just an easy example. Set timeout. Function. Try the function. Let's create a console.log. And set the console.log of, and let's say, I think comma is here. And let's say 5,000. Console.log. Sell that. Okay. So let's try to hit enter there. So set timeout is basically a web API that executes in the browser. Uh, and then inside of the set timeout, you can pass in a parameter and this time is a function and also another parameter setting the time which is five seconds the so 5000 is five seconds so the expected flow of this is console.log goes into the call stack pops out set timeout goes to the call stack and because it has a web api it goes to the web API section. And now the call stack is empty. Console.log Zelda gets called and pop out. After five seconds, set timeout is still in the web API. Instead of going back directly to the call stack, we'll call back queue. Again, this is a queuing system. And then now this guy is called event loop. The event loop, what it only does is it checks the call stack. The call stack is empty. I put the callback. Okay, let's try to run this one. Pause. That was so fast. Wait, did not save. Refresh, 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 refresh. I did save. Okay, now it's good. Rerun, rerun. Pause. So console.log legend was called, resume, pops out, it resolves. Next, calls the set timeout. And because set timeout is a web API, this is also true when you're doing a DOM manipulations. Pops out of the call stack, goes to the web API. It's called anonymous because um, we just created an anonymous function. Right now, while it's loading, look at the call stack, it will call the next one. It does not wait for it. Calls the console.log Zelda, pops it out, and we can go ahead and wait for this. After five seconds, the anonymous function, which is the console.log with the parameter of off, it goes to the callback queue. And the event loop checks if there's something in the call stack. If no, Click, click, let's try to rerun instead. Five seconds. There you go. Again, we can have one more run and we can pause it there. Five seconds. Goes to the call stack and now it can execute the console.log. And now it's stuck, it's stuck again. Okay.
Let's quickly tackle some Madia's point and go to the lecture. Let's see. It's the previous one. Don't need this one. Don't need this one. So um, there's a question when it comes to a stack versus queue. Is it a stylistic choice or are there major compilation differences? Uh, I didn't have the time to check the major compilation differences, but basically you need the stack and queues. If you want to really enforce the LIFO and FIFO, first in, first out, and last in, first out. Because um, just by using array, um, again, arrays are so flexible and users can just uh, access uh, different parts of the array. And let's say you're creating a queuing system, you don't really want to put an array there. Okay. What else? Asynchronicity and pros. I did not really check that one out because I got confused as well with the analogy. It's so confusing. I don't really understand. Uh, common JS. Now there's a built in module system. Is common JS still used? And if so, what is it used for? Why is no JS needed for JavaScript? The first one is common JS is the module specification standard used in Node.js. So if you're using Node.js to run your JavaScript file, you already have this common JS module. And then as we did a while ago, that the one that did not work is you just use the require, which is part of the common JS module standard to import a module or import a file, or import a function, import an object, okay? What are callbacks? Um, basically, the word is call me maybe, and it's, uh, I have it on the lecture. Let's see, can any program be written to be asynchronous and also be synchronous? It, since asynchronous is more complex, okay? So again, callback is a function that is executed right after another function has finished executing, okay? So it needs to resolve that other function first before it gets to resolve itself. Itself meaning the callback function. Uh, let's see. Uh, for the other one, complexity functions are over there, functions are Yeah, okay. Um, let's see. I think we can go ahead with the lecture. And uh, let's see. Synchronous programming and um, integrating code with TypeScript and JavaScript. First things first, we talked about modules. Modules are, oh, why do I have game show? Modules are fundamental building blocks of the code structure. We already mentioned that a while ago. Um, it also allows you to organize your code, hide information, and only expose public infer, uh, interface. Again, that's encapsulation. Uh, why do you need to use modules, though? Uh, it's better maintainability, namespacing, and reusability. So as, also as well that you don't accidentally change a global variable, things like that. And um, e easier for reusability, you can just import and then extend your own and then export it. But be careful though, because um, if you use a lot of modules, you become dependent on them. So let's say there's a vulnerability in a, in a module. Now you have to fix that. But the sad part is in JavaScript, when you're developing, you always have a lot of modules like tons of them for just a very, very small project. Uh, example of modules, we already have the common JS, required JS, Webpack, Bubble. Bubble is just a way to uh, translate to older JavaScript. Webpack, that's Webpack again. Module bundler, Main purpose is to bundle JavaScript files for usage in the browser. Webpack is another thing that you have to know, really know. Uh, it's 
used all the time. Um, what are packages? A package in Node.js contains all the files you need for a module. You can check that usually either in your global or in your local project folder. It's called node underscore modules, and there's tons of them. Uh, modules are JavaScript libraries that you can include in your project. Um, puts modules in place so that node can find them and manages dependencies, conflict, and, all, and conflicts. So we already have this when you install node, you already have uh, installed the node package manager. Again, that's the one that manages your modules. It is also used to publish, discover, install, and develop node programs. So even as right now, if you thought of a simple thing that could help people, let's say create some simple calculations, simple functions, you can already publish that. And then it's part of the node NPM ecosystem, okay? And most of the time you do install, let's say, oh, I need a authentication system. You don't need to create something and there's a lot of holes and it takes you a lot of time. Usually you just look uh, in NPM, what are the common or um, popular that are kind of secure and just install. Let's say I want an authentication system, go to the NPM and look for it. Install it and integrate it in your code. And you would see a lot of that more in the full stack web development. Yep. Okay. Synchronous, basically if you have two lines of code, you have L1, L2, L2 cannot begin running until L1 has finished, okay? It's like, uh, the analogy is you can't buy a train ticket until all the people in front of you have finished buying theirs, okay? Unless you cut the line. Next is asynchronous, you have two lines of code, L1 and L2, but L2 runs before that task is complete, meaning before L1 completes, run, or L2 can run. An example of this one is when you go to a restaurant, you sit down and there are other people ordering their food, but you don't have to wait for the, the um, first person who ordered to get their food. So let's say Mahanza ordered and I ordered, I could get my meal first, right? So that's a analogy for asynchronous. Um, asynchronous also in JavaScript, it's a non-blocking IO model. You would hear that all the time. Asynchronous just basically means that non-blocking input output. Okay. However, though, um, I remember using the require whenever you create web apps. If you have require, it will wait for that require to finish getting all the modules first, and then it can do asynchronous programming. Uh, some phrases that you can use to remember. Um, when you say asynchronous, it just says it takes some time. It could be not right now, it could happen in the future. Uh, ex examples of uh, asynchronous in JavaScript, we used callbacks, promises, async and await. Event loops, okay? So we already talked about this a while ago with the um, very nice GUI. So the other one that you have to know about, we have the it just basically is where memory allocation and the allocation happens when you do some function call. And usually when you call functions, it goes to the call stack, and if it's resolved, meaning it returns already or resolves, it pops out out of the stack. If it uses a web API to do DOM, HTTP request, or like a set timeout, it goes here, finish this um, stuff, and instead of going back immediately to the call stack, it goes to this something called callback queue, okay? And then this callback queue, it waits for the event loop. The event loop checks, and if this is empty, I push. And just to, again, heap is where memory allocation, the allocation take place. Call stack is just a data structure, a stack data structure that records where we are in the program. Uh, web APIs are threads, processes, that you can create, uh, that you can request to perform any process while keeping the call stack clear. Okay, so again, you pop out the function, put that in the web API. And then event loop checks the call stack. If it's empty, then the first event in the callback queue, the one down here, uh, gets pushed to the call stack. 
um, some phrases that can remind you what is callback is it's a JavaScript function and you can say call you later or call me maybe. Uh, callback is a function that has to be executed after another function has finished executing, hence the name callback. You already tackled that one. Promises, again, promises are objects which can be returned synchronously from an asynchronous function, okay? Promises are used to handle asynchronous operations in JavaScript. That's why it's a promise. You execute it and you just wait if it happens or not. You resolve or you reject. And next, they can handle multiple asynchronous operations easily and provide better error handling than callbacks and events. And one thing is, I think, oh, it's in the next slide. Uh, can be done using a callback the promise can be done using the callback way from scratch, but using promises is much cleaner. Also, it saves you from callback hell. So instead of like callback, 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 it's like it's gonna be a nested function like this. With promises, you can just then, 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 then. It's like this one. So it's asynchronous. And if it's a callback function, it's gonna be like this. It waits for it to finish, waits to finish, waits to finish. Uh, a generator is just basically a function that can stop midway and continue from where it stopped. Okay, and here's how it looks like. If you have a normal function, you have a start and finish. If you have a uh, generator function, it starts and when it sees a yield, it says hold the program. Um, uh, and also, it kind of returns the value. It's like use this value, and then it pauses, and then if there's another program that dot next was invoked. It will start from this yield and it goes to the other yield that it sees. Okay, and then again it yields the value and pause the state or pause the program. Advantages of generators: um, it has lazy evaluation, meaning delayed expression, um, and then also evaluation until value is needed. So it does not evaluate a value until it's needed. That's what I say. Also, it's more memory efficient because values are only generated when needed. Unlike other functions, they, they are generated right away and sitting in the memory. Okay. Use cases of generators, uh, infinitely repeating array. You can also create a unique identifier. Again, as you can see, this is also a infinite loop keeps yielding keeps producing values zero one two three and whatever so another use case is if you want to use while loop you use a generator so that it just does it, it stops syntax of generators uh, you need the asterisk to denote that if the function is a generator and you use the yield keyword to resume or pause and returns an object with two properties when you invoke the dot next, which is the value and done. Value is just the value and done is the true or false if, it's, if we still have some more. Note on generators, um, again, there's a possibility that a generator may never finish. That's when you put it in the while loop. And I think that's about it. Any more questions? And, um, with this uh, asynchronous stuff, I think you're gonna um, go through it again with the full stack web development, okay? Um, don't you worry about the promises so much because uh, I don't think that's gonna be taught extensively for the full stack. And in my experience as well, it, it's, it's not really taught right away. Advanced level, yes. Um, what else? Um, any more questions from Madia's point? If I missed someone, clear, unclear? Okay, sure, sure, sure. Okay, and that's it now. So let's take a break.